Hi there, and welcome to the Love or Leave the Law podcast with your hosts, Adam Olette and Casey Berman. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Love or Leave the Law podcast. I'm Casey Berman with my host, Adam Olette. Say hi, Adam. Hey, everybody. Uh, very excited to have you back for this episode, and thank you again for being part of our community. We really, really appreciate it. And I'm really, really excited uh, this week, as I am every week when we uh, – uh, when we interview, when Adam and I are talking, or when we have guests on, but this week is even something special. Um, Alex Devendra is on this week, and Alex is someone I worked with uh, through my bo- blog, Leave Law Behind, um, as she's coming to us from Portland. And Alex is a, is a friend of mine, someone who has left the law uh, and really followed her unique genius. Alex, say hello to the audience, please. Hi, everyone. Glad to be here. Alex, we are so happy to have you. Let me tell you, everyone, a bit about Alex. Alex is in Portland now. Uh, She was in big law in San Francisco. Um, We worked together, and uh, while she was uh, beginning her family, left the law, um, left big law. We're going to talk about that and how she was able to to break free and created her own firm. It's a uh, design-driven firm that enables and helps uh, law firms to really kind of up-level their ability to, for, for design, for document redesign, pre- presentation redesign, kind of every from brand positioning to a lot of the collateral and work they create to really, uh, law firms are very slow to adopt design and Alex is here to really help them um, kind of increase and empower them to create better design, which can kind of help on, new, help cre- uh, get them new customers, help them impress with presentations and kind of across the board. Um, it's something that through our work together was really in alignment with Alex is good at, and, uh, and with what she enjoys. So I'm just ecstatic that she's been able to create a business that not only helps people, but also aligns with, uh, with what I know um, she's great at. So Alex, welcome. Thank so, you. So happy to have you. Yeah, it's great to be here. How are things with you? Good. Um, Good. As I was just saying, I'm 36, 37 weeks pregnant, so um, <laughs> feeling a little slow moving these days. But other than that, doing well. <laughs> That's right, everyone. Her second is on the way, and we actually had our editorial calendar her pushed out a few weeks. And Alex said, "You know, can can I can we push up when my interview is? I want to get this a little bit sooner." So, uh, Alex, thanks for making the time. We appreciate it. So, of course, great. Well, let's dive in. Um, you know, the first thing I think that's kind of uh, what I like to go through. Um, and maybe, first of all, I'd love for you to start if there's anything about your background you're working on now that I, that I didn't touch on. And then really the first question I have is about leaving the law and kind of maybe take us through um, really how it started. What, what are some of the, where do you feel that first pain of unhappiness? Or wait a minute, something's not right here. I, I need, something's going on. Can, can you take us through the initial stages? Yeah, and I think maybe even it might be helpful to take a step back and talk about how I got into the law in the first place because okay. I never considered law school or thought that that was something I would do growing up. Um, I was a French major in undergrad. I was working for a French company after school. Um, and then all my friends started going back to school and I kind of felt like I just wanted to be back in grad school, but I, did, I still didn't know what exactly I wanted to do. And I even considered going to pr- professional translation school. Mm. Um, I, and then I was living in Cleveland at the time because my husband was in med school there. And I started just, I got a random job. I couldn't find any French related jobs. I got a job working at a trust company and I was working on trust administration. So I was working with financial advisors and estate planning attorneys and trust officers who have JDs. And that was really my first major exposure to lawyers. And I could see how they were like really helping individuals um, and having a positive impact on their life. And so, and they were encouraging me to go to law school. So I saw it, I saw it as a path to go back to school and do something where I could be helping people. Um, and then I started just kind of incrementally studying for the LSAT, reading about law school, and everything I read and did, I liked, you know, I liked the analytical questions on the LSAT, and I liked law school. Um, and then I started law school in the fall of 2008, so I think it was like the second or third week of school, school when everything, everything I'd read about law school changed overnight. Right, um, <laughs> right, really, really. And, I think probably before then I had thought that I would 
not go into big law or or at least i wasn't sure about big law and then after kind of the whole economy changed it seemed like well you have to try and do the thing that everyone's doing because you know that's just what you do if you're doing well in law school and you kind of need to do that as a stepping stone to other things you know what's funny is i was just talking with the client on friday and I know this was my experience. A lot of people went to law school by default. That's just what you did. Uh, just because, uh, because for ethnic family reasons, because you don't want to get a job, but you actually saw attorneys helping people. You actually had a, a, a positive experience before you went, kind of thought about it critically. You just didn't go because. I would say I'm maybe more in the middle of there somewhere because it, was, it still felt like I kind of fell into it. Like I signed okay. up for the LSAT before I had really decided, but it seemed like, oh, well, you should at least sign up because it's only offered a few times a year. Oh, okay. It, it kind of just like each step kept happening before I'd really made up my mind. And then before I knew it, I was in law school. But Isn't I, it I funny was, how this important decision, we, like, we didn't even make up our mind. It just sort of happened, which some ways can be great. And other times you're not really thinking about it critically, which leads to a few years down the road going, wait a minute, where am I? What happened? Right. So, I mean, it's hard to say exactly, but it's, it yeah. seemed at the time like it was a good choice and that there would be multiple things I could do with that degree. Yeah. And then once I was in law school, it felt more like, okay, well, you kind of have to start with this one particular path because that's what all the successful people do. And, yeah. and you've got loans and all these other right. things. So right. I kind of found myself being funneled into this one particular path. Um, that I wasn't a hundred percent sure about. Um, what, when you went to law school, what was in alignment with you? What, what just came naturally well, in, in law school, not law yet, but in law school, like where did you feel that connection? Like, I like this, this is, this is flowing well. I mean, I like the, the deep reading and analysis and writing. I mean, I was a French lit major, so textual analysis and writing, um, Right. And grappling with language were all kind of things that I was used to and enjoyed. Right. So that was kind of the aspect I liked about it. Right. Right. Well, okay. clearly you were good at it because you graduated yeah. first in your class. So either that <laughs> or you're just really smart or both. I'm not sure. But uh, you must have liked it somewhat to, to, to get to that point. And uh, that was a stepping stone, I'm sure, to get you into big law. As, yeah, yeah. My, my, my resume, I'm first in my class at Case Western Reserve. Right? Yeah. Yeah, no, so true. so I ended up doing the big law summer associate job, and um, which a lot of people, you know, weren't even able to get as summers. And then I was lucky enough to get an offer at the end of the summer. And even at that point, I was like, I didn't really enjoy this. Um, this at the firm. Thing, at the firm yeah. as a summer associate. And granted, summer associate programs had changed, too. It was not right. quite lavish as it used to be. So it was more like a real, perhaps a little bit more of a real snapshot of what it would be like to be an associate. Mm, right. Um, and it wasn't that appealing to me. But again, I just felt like, well, you can't say no. You kind of have to do yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. So I said yes. Um, and, and so e even starting from the very beginning, I would say there was the, always this inkling that I'm not sure this is really what I want to be doing long term. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What now that we have some law students, we have, you know, first years here, thoughts as they're starting out or thoughts as they're still in law school. Um, I know some advice I give to people back then, but this idea of like, you couldn't say no. How, how does someone who's 22, 23, 24 uh, with, with loans or with that pressure of, hey, this is a big job, how, how could they possibly say no? I mean, I think it, it's a really individual decision. Like, I'm the type of person I try not to regret anything I've done. So yeah. I don't regret the fact that I went into big law and had that yeah. experience. And I'm trying to use that experience to my benefit. Um, and I'm appreciative of that experience. But I think I also could have, <laughs> if I had had a little more confidence or if you know some other factor had been different, maybe I would have been more willing to kind of strike out on a different path right from yep. the get go and if P i think if you kind of intuitively feel like that's what you want to do there's no reason not to 
and that's part of, of our writings, Adam's, mine, um, part of the, the goal of this podcast is to give people that confidence, is to show them these opportunities and why we're, we're talking with folks like yourself. Um, it is. I mean, it comes down to, I know, where I, like, you don't even know any better. You just, you don't have the confidence. You don't, you don't know what you don't know. So you just kind of go down that path. And I'm sure it's really hard for people who go directly to, I, t- I worked for three years before I went back to law school and I mm-hmm. definitely appreciated that being in law school. I felt like that gave me an edge mm-hmm. and yeah. an extra level of maturity. Yeah. Um, once I graduated, it, it felt less that way. I felt like, oh, now I'm kind of starting from the same place as everyone else yeah. I graduated with and they're three years younger and yeah. <laughs> wouldn't it be nice to get three years of your life back? That's right. But I'm, I, I think it did help me with the path into law school. But if, you've, if you're just 22 and you're going into law school and you've never had a quote unquote real job, I'm sure that's even more difficult because you don't yeah. even have anything that else to compare it to. That's right. That's right. Now, I want to, we want to get into your path out, but looking back, maybe people you've kept in touch with, which lawyers have um, really connected with the law still? Uh, they enjoy the law. They like the law. It's part of what I call their unique genius. Are there, are there any that you're still in touch with or that you know about or maybe when you were at the firm that, you know, maybe you weren't really connecting with the law firm, but, but they were? Any examples of that? <laughs> uh, let me get back to you on that one. <laughs> there are some. Really? It's just far and few there between. Are some. I just have to. <laughs> yeah. You know, part of it is that I didn't, um, I didn't make as much of an effort as I should have in law school to connect with my classmates. Um, As I said, I've been working and my husband was already in med school. So we had all his group (laughs) of friends. So I didn't try as hard as I should have to really make a community within the law school. And and I do wish I'd done that more. Um, And then on top of that, I moved out out of state afterwards. So I'm not as connected with my law school alum classmates as I should be. Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking more just of like people who are in big law in San Francisco. Yeah. I'm sure there's some that enjoy it. <laughs> Let me well, think what did, that. when you think you do, you, you align with the analytical thinking top of your class, well on the LSAT, then the firm, what was it that really wasn't in alignment with you? The law, the practice of the law. I think it more had to do with just the law firm culture and Mm -hmm. culture of the workplace than the actual work Um, or even the the individual people, because I worked with good people. um, But it was like this kind of overarching culture that was just hard to um, work within. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I see that a lot. You know, you hear the, the lack of mentoring or the just sitting by yourself, you know, very isolated, not a lot of collaboration. There's obviously the, the pressure of deadlines and fiduciary duties and so on. What, what was it about the culture? Was it, was it mercenary? Was it everyone on their own? What, what exactly was it that, that didn't align with you? Yeah, and it wasn't it, it wasn't even that so much though. I, I think that might be more true in in other firms, but um, I was at a firm that was known for being relatively nice um, mm-hmm. and having relatively good like lifestyle. Right. Um, but even so, I mean, well, first the w- one thing I remember even from just being a summer associate was that the billable hour model was so um, that's what I was going to ask you about. Cause the, it's yeah. cru- it crushes people. I mean, it's just overwhelming, crazy. Well, and it was also just scary. Like even yeah. as a summer associate, I was like scared to go and knock on someone's door and introduce myself because I felt like I was interrupting them uh, and taking yeah. away their billable time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it was just like a really weird environment to be dropped in and not really know what the etiquette was. Right. Um, and then, once I actually w- was a, a junior associate and had a billable hour requirement, like it's just kind of like this weird mind game. Like what, what, yeah. counts, like, what should I be charging for? I mean, they would try to give us trainings on like how to write time entries and how to account for your time, but it still felt very nebulous and yeah. like unclear how this was really supposed to work. Yeah. Right. You know, Adam came from, the the smaller firm model and i know we had kind of talked about that but it it really seems like 
it, it was something that you couldn't escape, whether it's the, the billing from the big firm um, or, or the networking, there was just this, I know when you and I talked, it was like, well, even if you go somewhere small, it, it's a smaller environment, but your firm had a good, uh, you know, life work balance. It, it seemed like this dynamic would, would always be there in, in one form or another. And I felt that even more acutely kind of after I came back from maternity leaves because it just felt like, okay, I have all this incentive to do my work efficiently and get out the door maybe a half an hour early so I can get home and see my daughter. Right. And that seemed so out of alignment with the, just the work model. Like how could I, there's no way to be efficient yeah. And leave early because yeah. there's no way you can get your eight hour day done in seven hours. That's right. You just have to stay and bill an extra hour. <laughs> like, and, and then you've got, you know, keep your sanity, be mindful, go work out, take some time off in life. You know, there's all these other things that we should or want to do. And, and you know, there's no way you're going to get to it. It, it, it just, it, it just, something had to give. Yeah. And yeah. I tried going to 80%, like, I'd actually gotten a lot of warnings that I shouldn't go to 80% or a reduced schedule because there's stigma attached to that or all these other reasons. Um, and so I did try going back full time and right. that just for, again, a variety of factors wasn't working. Um, what were you like, feeling like when you were there yeah. at the office full time, your, your daughter is, you know, a few months old somewhere like what, what were you feeling? Um, moments of overwhelm. Um, and it wasn't even that I like just wanted to be at home all the time with my daughter. It was more like, and, and like I said, I think this was just quirky things happening in my cases. We ha like, for example, I had one case that was in federal court. We weren't expecting a tentative um, decision on our motion, but we got one on Thursday evening so, and it was against us. So all of a sudden I have to stay up late Thursday night doing research for the hearing on Friday, which I wasn't expecting to have to do. Right. And at the same time, my husband was in the ER with norovirus. Oh, and then man. when we, so I had to like work from home. And then when he got home at midnight, I had to go out and find a 24 hour pharmacy to get his medicine. <laughs> and then oh. when I woke up the next morning, my daughter had gotten it. Yeah, of course. But, um, I took her to daycare anyway because I had this hearing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It was just wow. like this crazy confluence of factors. And then like two weekends later in a different case, this random judge denied our request for an extension of time to answer the complaint, which oh. seemed really kind of out of left field. And so all of a sudden I'm having to draft an answer over the weekend. And like my husband works at the hospital, so he works a lot of weekends. So it was just like, yeah. I didn't have the backup plans in place <laughs> to deal well, with this. Sounds like it was a perfect storm to help you to yeah. figure out something else to do because it wasn't going to work this way for you, especially with your husband being a doctor and, you know, the doctor lawyer kind of thing doesn't mer merge meld very well either because both are very time intensive. And especially if you're both newer, oof, wow, you guys had your hands full and a, yeah, and a baby guess, like, in a different you know, if we'd had a nanny or had family nearby to help, it could have been different. But we're living in San Francisco. We're like barely making ends meet mm. <laughs> and we don't have a nanny. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny. Like, I was, I was, uh, I just heard the song, the Willie Nelson song, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. And he says, you know, have them make sure they're a doctor or a lawyer and such. Yeah. And <laughs> here, Alex, like you guys are doctors and lawyers. You're skimping by and you know, no family around. And it's, it's not as glamorous as Willie Nelson makes it sound. <laughs> no, it was not very glamorous. Uh, <laughs> and so that was kind of after like a bunch of things like that happened. I was like, okay, well this isn't working. Yeah. Um, let me try going 80%. And, um, and that actually was working in the sense that I was, I had a big piece of complex <clears throat> litigation that could take up my time, but wasn't very fast moving. Mm -hmm. So there weren't a lot of emergencies coming up and the partners on the case were really cool. And they, and I, it let me have Fridays to kind of collect myself and yeah. grocery shop or do whatever I needed to do. I kept my daughter in school, f daycare five days a week. Um, so like that actually as a schedule wise was working. Right. But then um, all those things I've been worried about, about just like 
a reduced schedule at a law firm not really working culturally yeah seemed to be playing out and yeah yeah so the track to partner cool. is is uh kind of muddied when you reduce your workload huh yeah, I mean, I, I don't think else. I even stayed long enough to know if that's really true, but it, it just, it just seemed to me that like it wasn't going to work. So yeah. that was kind of the last straw. Understandable. You know, we asked Liz Brown this uh, on a previous episode. Um, you know, she was big law professor now and, and wrote Life After Law. Uh, we had a great, great talk with her. Um, more than happy to, to contact you guys. I think you'd really enjoy enjoy meeting with her and she'd enjoy hearing your story. Um, but she talked a lot about the challenges that women face. I mean, what is there a way around this? Is is having a child and working at big law, is it just mutually exclusive or do you just run into these? Any any advice or tips for for women who are who are were in your place or who might be there? I mean, there's certainly lots of women who do it. I still don't really know how they do it. I had a friend of mine who was at a different firm. Um, she had two children. She actually had her first child in her three all year. And then she had another child when she was, I think, a junior associate. Um, and her husband was in residency, like my husband. Mm -hmm. um, and she was working full time at a firm. And somehow she was doing it, but... And she didn't seem miserable either. I mean, she was definitely, there were moments of overwhelm. She was like in trial. Yeah. And I was like, I just don't know how you're doing this. Right. That's right. Amazes <laughs> so me. It's doable, but then, then you hear like, I saw someone post on Twitter the other day. Oh, an interview with such and such female attorney at, at this big firm showing that women really can have it all. And first of all, the article like didn't touch on that really at all. And, and the only reference to it was the fact that like her firm would FedEx her breast milk back home when she was like out of state for trial. Oh, and I was like, I don't know that that really counts as having it all. No, <laughs> right. I don't either. <laughs> right. Right. So. And I think that, you know, to the point here, it, different things work for different people, but I think, you know, if you want to actually have that presence with, with your children or even with yourself, time to meditate and so on, um, you know, that, that you got to make that a priority. And too often we don't, and we've just got a schedule where everything's regimented nine minutes or 10 minutes or so on. And um, that can make life pretty harried. Uh, I know it has for me. I've tried to to scale back. I want to see my kids. I have two. And, and even as a father, and my kids are nine and six now, it, it's difficult uh, to even fit in time there, much less with kind of this overbearing trial like like you were talking about and, and with a baby. Um, so. Well, and I think that gets to the point that like it is a struggle for everyone, even when you like what you do. Yeah. Um, and one thing I noticed was that as soon as I quit the firm and started doing my own thing, like I thought I would have all this – extra control over my schedule and be able to work when I wanted and c stop working when I wanted. But what I found out was like, Oh, now I love what I'm doing so much that I want to be working. All nah, the time. That's what <laughs> and happens. I, and so, and it's, and <laughs> I, so all great. these ideas are flowing and yep. so it's hard to stay organized because there's just so much, to so think much about. there. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not that other people are telling me to do things. <laughs> it's just like happen, happening on its own. So I think, for me, but it's like a different kind of stress because it's like self-imposed and I'm enjoying it to some degree. Yeah. I think it's still important not to try not to get burned out, but I think that goes back to your point that like the problem with what, with my previous job was that it wasn't in alignment with what I wanted to be doing. Um, so you can so say that it's all these, the work schedule or the demand, right. but that's, I think just really another way of saying that it, those demands weren't, satisfying you somehow yeah hey there this interview is not over this is the end of part one part two will continue next week so make sure you join us for the continuation of this amazing interview thanks and we'll see you soon mm -hmm.